welcome to this very special webinar on International Women's Day from Good Finance. And I'm Geeta, Head of Engagement at Big Society Capital, and we are partners in Good Finance, which is the go-to website for social enterprises and charities who are navigating the world of social investment. Um, we wanted to celebrate the very special role that women play in social investment today, and I'm delighted that we've got a fantastic panel here to, dis to discuss this topic with us. So first of all, we have Dr. Thelma Lowick, um, who has had a long career in academia and has entered the world of social investment as a private investor. Welcome, Thelma. Hello. Um, and then in Birmingham, we have Grace England, um, who oversees Residences Social Investment Tax Relief Funds. So that the, they enable investors like Thelma to invest in the world of social enterprise and charities. And then um, finally, we're really privileged to have um, Celia Hodson from up in Edinburgh, who is the founder and chief exec of Hey Girls. And, and, and Hey Girls has managed to give away over, I think, two million pounds, uh, two million a free period products to girls and women who are on low incomes um, across the UK and she's also on the board of Social Investment Scotland. Just to kick off really, um, this week has been full of um, celebrations of women who are doing great things in every walk of life as well as a reminder of just how far we have to go in achieving equality for women and girls. I wondered if you had a sense of what um, female-led social enterprises and charities that you found inspiring and why? Very good question to kick off with. So there are Many, so I probably will miss out a lot because I tried to pick out just three that I thought gave a kind of thread of different types of social enterprises. Um, the first one that always comes to my mind is uh, Miss Macaroon, which is, was founded by Rosie Ginday in Birmingham. So I'm obviously biased because I'm Birmingham based, but I walk past the Miss Macaroon shop, their kind of Prosecco bar every day on the way to work. And it looks amazing. It's super professional. It's always full of people. And I think it's just a brilliant example of how businesses can be really successful and offer great quality and service, but also have a positive social impact and use their profits in a really positive way. Because Miss Macaroon support lots of young people that have barriers to employment to find kind of new opportunities and um, get into the world of work. So yeah, I think just a brilliant example of a really successful social enterprise. I also wanted to highlight Rio run by um, Lindsay Hall. So they, if you haven't heard them, they are a social enterprise that bring ethical business thinking and kind of imaginative thinking into education and also commercial businesses. They are really innovative and ambitious and I'd say kind of quite risk-taking, all kind of in the name of finding kind of solutions to social problems. Um, and then finally, I wanted to celebrate Beyond Autism. Um, so Beyond Autism we support people with autism to lead kind of full lives and have really positive educational experiences and to really celebrate their abilities in lots of kind of innovative educational interventions. I'm a very small group of parents um, that set up many years ago just to try and help their kids um, realise their potential and now it's a huge social enterprise that I think is almost £5 million pounds worth of turnover that work right across um, the whole of London so I just think a great example of the potential that social enterprise has. I wondered if Resonance themselves, if you've invested into any women-led organisations or with all organisations tackling women's issues? Yes, so the final two, Rio and Beyond Autism, we've helped both of those social enterprises raise investment so they're kind of two examples. Um, it was a really good question actually I said to you beforehand because when you asked this when I saw this question I thought oh yes there must be loads but I was actually surprised there is probably fewer um social enterprises that we've invested in that are led by women than men um and I guess yeah I've just been thinking this morning why that might be um so in the West Midlands fund that you mentioned that's the fund that I manage from our Birmingham office um it is a new fund so it's only been going since um, August last year, so we've just done our first six months, we've made our first three investments. Um, none of those are female-led, which I'm sad to say, but the good news is we have got our next three in the pipeline are female-led, so hopefully we'll have a 50-50 split in a few months' time. Um, our Bristol fund are the same structure, I'd say it's about 5 to 30% of our investees are um, um, led by women so again not the 50 50 split we'd like to see but um definitely going in the right direction um so yeah if one thing i'm taking away today is to really think why that might be and trying to um think of ways that we can make sure we overcome that encourage more female-led social enterprises to kind of take on the next step in their journey and kind of grow their social enterprise 
That's great, Grace. Thank you. And actually, that to be honest, that paints probably a much better picture than, than in mainstream business in terms of women-led businesses accessing finance. So thank you for that. So, I mean, you, we were talking just before we started and you were telling us about how in Scotland um, over 60% of social enterprises are now um, started up by women. Um, and we were also talking about the picture in the UK with and more broadly with 40 odd percent of social enterprises being led by women, which is a really, really great picture. I noticed this week that um, the positive investment platform, FX, shared a bit of their research around attitudes to investing this week. And they talked about the fact that actually women are much less likely to invest um, than men. So I wondered if you could share a bit about what brought you into, what were you into the world of investments actually and social investments? Well, I consider myself, I'm that generation that I consider had it all. I had a free, good education, I've had free healthcare, I've basically, and I've had opportunity. And yeah, I've been quite successful. And I just felt that I'm coming up to retirement and it's time to give something back. And then I looked around and I mean, I'm not a wealthy investor by any means. I'm, I'm one of the small investors, but I see it as a way of, of giving back. And if I can do something useful and it happens to make me a little bit of money, then what's not to like? And it's as simple as that. That's fantastic. So you hadn't been an investor before. No, so not this was all. really about a no, way of this, just giving back. Yes, it was just looking around for something that I thought was interesting, I thought was useful, and that perhaps I could be, yeah, do something useful. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you invested and, and how that came about? Well, somebody told me about social investment mm -hmm. and I thought I knew nothing about it because I'm not a finance person. I've been in higher education all my career. And I started to read a bit about it and I just thought, I just like this idea. Mm -hmm. Not particularly focused in women, it's just focused on society. I, I see it as a, an excellent way to, I suppose it sounds a bit altruistic, but when you think about in the past companies like Cadbury, who were enlightened employers mm -hmm. who were trying to improve the lot of the, mm -hmm. the workforce, and I see it a little bit like that, um, we're giving opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is important. It's really interesting that you, might, uh, you mentioned Cadbury because actually lots of those, um, those companies in those days and now Sussex Foundations who were making social investments as well as their That's grant right. making, yeah. so it's just well, a really it interesting thing that, 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 that yeah. cycle kind of continues. Yeah. Um, and what if your social investments have particularly inspired you, the, if you in terms of where your money's gone? Um, well, I live in Birmingham, mm -hmm. so I got particularly interested in the, the Jericho Project, mm -hmm. um, which is helping disadvantaged people from all Works, uh, walks of life. Mm -hmm. What I really liked about it was the, the diversity and the, there's a number of different projects but teaching people to get on, to pick themselves up, to get out there, mm -hmm. giving them the tools to get back into society and I think that's fantastic and I think that's well worth supporting. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Um, are there more lots of women investors like Velma out there do you think and what's what's your experience in terms of bringing in individuals into your work? Um, just to add to Thelma's answer as well, actually, about Jericho, and just as an aside, Jericho have got a really um, a brilliant programme that works specifically with um, a lot of women in an area of Birmingham where modern slavery is quite a big issue and kind of um, human trafficking is still a big issue. Jericho is doing a brilliant bit of work, uh, particularly with women trying to provide employment and training opportunities to women to give them opportunities to try and get out of that um, kind of space so yeah just to give a shout out to Jericho. In terms of female investors it is one of my passions I guess um, to try and get more female investors uh, working with us because it definitely is a very very small number so I think off the top of my head I think there's there's probably a handful actually we've got 150 investors in our SOTR funds a handful of those probably 10% I would say, are women. And again, there shouldn't be any real reason for that. Yeah, there's lots of hugely successful women out there that I know would want to invest for impact, but for some reason they aren't getting through to the, the funds that we manage as much as kind of male investors are. So that's one of my passions, I guess, is trying to get more women involved um, in investing for impact. Thank you. Um, could you maybe let us know how you how you found out about the, the Resonance SITR firm? Because I think some, some of the barriers around people getting involved or to do with actually just making the making those connections yeah. somebody um, well my financial advisor it sounds very grand somebody's helping me sort my pension out basically i know what it was i came across this term ethical banking which i thought was a sort of oxymoron <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then that's how the conversation started and then 
I then of course I started Googling it. And I knew about the Jericho project and I knew about that because I was looking around for somebody to, I was thinking about having a new bathroom actually. <laughs> And, and Jericho are coming in a couple of weeks. Wow! Um, okay. To start on this uh, this new bathroom project, and so it, it it went on from there. And then I found out about Resonance, mm -hmm. and then I contact I think I made contact with Grace, and she invited me to uh, mm -hmm. an event in the Birmingham City Centre. Mm -hmm. And then I decided um, yeah, to put some money, yeah. and the rest is history. Great, fantastic! Yeah, I'm very enthusiastic about this form of investment because it, it's a no-brainer. Why isn't everybody doing it? And how, what do you think we could do to spread the word? Well, I think we, we just have to um, increase, raise our profile. And what I noticed, and I, I felt completely naive to this because I am absolutely brand new well, to the finance sector. And when I went to, um, Grace, what was the event that we had in Birmingham last summer? Yeah, it was 90% men, I should think, or even 95%. And I started talking to people and they were almost like, well, we don't do this sort of thing. And I just said, well, why not? And nobody could give me an answer. And I asked that question to quite a few men and they couldn't give me an answer. So I just think we need to get the word out. Simple as that. Well, there's a, there's a call to arms in terms of getting, yeah, getting, spread, spreading the word and, 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 to, and doing what we can to bring more women into, into this space. Bring everybody into this space, not just women. Yeah. Grace, one of the questions that we had in advance was, um, was I think, from a, from a social enterprise that wanted to know where to go when you're starting out. I'm not just saying this because I'm on a good finance, a good finance webinar, but a um, good finance resource, I think, is something we've needed in the sector for a very long time. So it's definitely a kind of one stop shop for you to go and have a little explore of what support is out there and what kind of different types of social um, investment are out there and what they all mean um because I, I do think a big barrier to anyone engaging with social investment is that i think the world of finance and investment can feel quite technical and there's lots of jargon and i think a lot of people just think that's really scary it's not for me i don't know whether i can trust investors they're all these kind of banker types that um use all these fancy words yeah i think i'd encourage people just to do their own research kind of get clued up on it because, and just encourage people that it definitely um is a lot simpler than maybe the finance world make you feel but i'd also encourage people just to have a chat with folks like myself and other kind of social investors in the sector as well because a huge part of my job is just chatting to people going to see their social enterprises learning a bit more about what they do and that's the best bit of my job definitely so if you do you know want to chat about it there's lots of opportunities to have a kind of non you know no commitments um no strings attached conversations with folks like me and others in the sector so I'd encourage you to kind of yeah think big and think what more you could do um if investment was available and then just start talking to people really and I'm sure you'd be surprised at what doors will start to open that's great great I completely echo all of that and there's lots lots of friendly people in social investment that are more than happy to have that conversation so tell us a bit about the Hey Girl story and journey. Hey Girls was um, founded just 12 months ago by myself and my daughters. We set it up to, erad to have a go at eradicating period poverty in the UK, a pretty hairy, audacious goal. Um, and very quickly, the, the organization began to grow. Uh, our biodegradable sani pads arrived on the 7th of January uh, 2018, and we started selling one day after with quite a big media launch. We were successful in getting listings in Asda and Waitrose and very quickly realised that we were going to need some investment to take up those opportunities. So we worked with um, Big Issue Invest and we took a 100k loan to be able to drive the pipeline of products so that we could get those listings. And so the organisation has continued to grow pretty quickly. We now have got um, pads, tampons, menstrual cups and reusable pads and so this month we'll be launching, launching our applicator tampon which is actually made from sugarcane extract. Um, I thought that our business would mainly be around online and retail sales through supermarkets as I've mentioned but then public procurement there was opportunities around winning awards, washroom solutions, as it's called up here in Scotland, to provide menstrual products to schools and council buildings, etc. So we pitched for that through, it took a lot of rigour to get us onto into sort of a state where we could apply for those contracts. And fortunately, we, we won the Scottish wide. 
contract. So, so it went from an idea to providing menstrual product out across the whole of Scotland and supermarkets and selling online, um, probably, you know, absolutely way before we were ready. So the investment from big issue investors think that made it all possible. So yeah, it's been an, inter- it's an, an interesting journey and it's a little bit like it's building the plane as you're flying it really because you are building policies and procedures as you go. And one of the very interesting things about winning the washroom solutions contract is, you know, we had all our own policies in, in-house already, but then to apply for public, public procurement, you have to not only get your own policies in place, but all the people that you work with and our organization works more or less exclusively with social enterprise. So we're having to say to those that packed our product, could we see your environmental policy and your child slavery policy and your diversity policy mm-hmm. and our, you know, our logistics company and those that we were buying products of, they wanted to see them from them as well. So it was quite a wake up call to, if you want to do business with public sector, you've got to really start to do your homework and get everything um, into a very business like uh, position when you're still just starting off. And so the most exciting part about the whole building Hegel's is the importance of our network. So and that comes from the investment side, from the sort of HR and business development side, from the branding side, from our, our customers, which I find incredibly exciting um, to know that there's that level of support out there and people want you know getting behind a mission and uh, something that's now a viable enterprise. I don't know whether I, want, I don't know whether your experience is, is actually rare in terms of women startups being able to get to that reach and scale so so quickly. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on your experience as a, as a woman entrepreneur in a space where startups going from startup to growth is mostly male dominated, and whether actually that hasn't been an issue for you, or maybe some of the things you've, you've talked about building your network, maybe being a woman has been useful in some of that. Um, I think that's probably the most important question that we ask ourselves today. And I've just been sitting on a panel with the, uh, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, and mm-hmm. someone there that, that runs a business advice organisation said that typically women, uh, when they start to talk about their enterprise, the support and the conversations become pinked and shrinked. I think that, you know, that, that's an incredible quote that, we think that women want to do business in a different way and they yeah. think that we're risk averse mm-hmm. and we think that we want to stay small mm-hmm. niche but actually you know, women in business want all different levels of enterprise and some want to fit it around their lives and others just want to really go for it and others want to do both of those things so I think there is a very different conversation happening around women in, in enterprise and it's our duty to um to be out there saying, you know, I'm female and I'm scaling this business mm-hmm. no matter what you have to think about it. You know? right. So I think it's very interesting times. Yeah, it sounded like, you know, you were able to access investment from Big Issue Invest fairly early on. Um, is there anything that would have made that experience easier for you? No, I mean, certainly in Scotland, as I mentioned, the, the business support landscape mm-hmm. here is good for all yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, in terms of social enterprise support, I can hand on heart say that we wouldn't have been able to scale Hegel's as quickly or maybe even at all if we weren't in Scotland. So there's a lot of investment up here from all different stages. So there's a little bits of grants to get you going through to early stage, very, very soft loans that are supported by the Scottish government through to you know larger investment that's really about taking on um, in a significant size um either loans or equity investment. So I think it's um, I think it's a really great shift. Today there's been announcements around um, new programs for women who are specifically wanting to use investment to grow their enterprises, mm-hmm. lots more growth plans. Mm-hmm. So yeah, some good announcements good. coming out yeah. today. This is like encouraging signals for what's what's ahead mm-hmm. for but for women in, in business. I wanted to just kind of go back to the maybe the theme of today, which is balance for better. And we've had a couple of questions come in um, directed at a couple of us which speak to those themes of balance. One of the questions for me was actually to share my own experience of how I came into social investment. I came in from the voluntary sector, so I've, I've had spent my career in voluntary sector finance roles. I was um, finance director at disability, uh, disability charity Scope before I joined BSE. 
Um, and at that time, I led on a, a various social investment initiatives and raised social investment. And it was that direct experience that made me really passionate about trying to make social investment more accessible um, for charities and social enterprises. And to speak to Grace's point, try and be the um, translate some of this stuff that can feel quite inaccessible. I think the the, the piece about balance, I think, for inter is interesting to me because it isn't isn't so much necessarily about being a woman versus being a man, it's just probably as much about coming from a different sector into a sector that is financial focused. And obviously we've got Thelma here that doesn't have a financial sector background either. And I think the thing, thing I've probably learned over the, that time is, is to not be intimidated by that financial sector, either jargon or culture, and to be really focused on the things that you bring and the things that you know well um, and the things that you care about. But we had a question for you, Grace, it was how do you think that we could bring more young women to want to work it work in social investment and be able to think that they could do a job like yours a good question i think the more women that we have out there kind of publicly speaking about these things the better really so i think one of the changes i'm starting to see i mean my career in this space hasn't been massively long i've been working in this sector for about seven years um but definitely even in that time i'd say when I kind of started out in the sector and would be kind of speaking at events or on panels, I would always be the only woman speaking. And that still is the case at mainstream um, investor conferences, to be fair, I still am probably one of maybe two women speaking at, at the whole event. But in the social investment sector, there's definitely been a really positive shift, I would say, into all female panels or um, majority female speakers at events. So I think that's been really, really encouraging to see and has encouraged me as well to kind of keep speaking publicly and kind of sharing my own opinions and things alongside other women. So I think that's a really good shift. I was actually at a social investor conference last year. I think it was last year, maybe the year before. Anyway, in recent years where this came up actually as a big topic in the sector of how we can get more women kind of speaking publicly and kind of uh, representing social investment. There was a number of men at that event that actually committed to not agreeing to be on panels if there were no women represented, uh, which I thought was great kind of step in the right direction definitely a small step but um, I have seen that have an impact at some of the events I've been at where um, I'm no, no longer the only woman speaking there. Even th small things like that, I think, can really help to shift people's perceptions and help people think, you know, actually, I could work in this sector and I could speak about it and represent kind of women. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just a small step. It doesn't sound very ambitious, but I mean, if there's anybody out there that wants to get into this sector and would like to kind of chat to me more about it, I'm more than happy to do that. So any ideas, very welcome of how we could get more women into the sector. That's great. But I think the point about visibility and um, people thinking that actually there are people out there that, that they're making this feel accessible is really, really important. Thank you. Well, no, I think the accessibility is part of it. When we've got to get away from women trying to be honorary men, we bring something different. We work in slightly different ways. We're different. And so you just want to be more inclusive mm -hmm. um, rather than competitive, competing and going, look, between us, we can, we can do more. Men and women working together, you get more than some parts. And that's what balance should be. And that's, that's what balance should be about. That's what it's all about to me. And as, as Grace says, we've just got to get out there and spread the message. I think you and others are what we'll be doing, we'll be doing more, I think. So, yeah, I wondered if the, the, the whole theme of balance for better, um, I know you're on the board of Social Investment Scotland, and I'm interested in kind of your experience in terms of what you think you and I think you have at least one other fellow um, woman board member bring to, bring to the Social Investment Scotland board in terms of that balance. Yeah, um, so Social Investment Scotland is, I would say, is a, is a fairly balanced board. It, it wasn't when I joined, but over the last 12 months, they've actually made an effort, really have significant effort to think about um, gender balance across their executive and through their board. Um, and I think it is our duty as as female executives to you know to try and make space for women and girls to be more visible and to take part and i think we also got to be mindful of taking others with us rather than climbing on the shoulders of each other to get there so i think you know really making space mentoring young women and getting young women to mentor you i think is an inter you know is an interesting exchange i'm i'm very I'm very grateful that I work with uh, incredibly bright, articulate young women and quite often I find that the role reversal slips in where they're leading conversations and they're being absolutely, you know, in control. So I think, you know, making, as I say, making space 
for other women to succeed mm-hmm. rather than shoving us out of the way like you know that, that guys do to women who want to set up a social enterprise what would your top tip be i have um, a bit of a holy trinity of a business <laughs> startup and i think that that starts with starting we're, we're very tempted to write a beautiful business plan and keep polishing it and editing it and making sure it looks incredible and not actually moving into action and using, oh, my business plan's not completed as, as an excuse because it's, you know, it's, it's scary, scary stuff to do a business. But I think women take a different look at risk. I would say knowing where you can flex. So when we started Hey Girls, I thought that our market was online and as I mentioned, in, in supermarkets, but when public sector contracting became a real opportunity, we had to flex pretty quickly. So I think, you know, not being too rigid, if you mm-hmm. can see a market opportunity, then why wouldn't you go for that if it's if it's absolutely on mission? And then I think women have a great opportunity to be honest about themselves and be authentic. Um, people by people, we know that. Yes, they want the stats and the facts and things, but actually... You know, why are you leading this enterprise? What has driven you to make a social change? Because if you've got a compelling story and you're well rooted within your social enterprise, you're far less likely to jump out when things get tough. And, you know, boy, they they do get tough within any enterprise, but social enterprise seems more so just by the very nature. So I think, you know, telling your story, which, you know, for someone that brought their kids upon benefits, I found really hard to actually go there and, and be honest about that. But I think you have a duty to be yourself and be the best that you can be. So those would be my, you know, my my top tips. And why and why not you? You know, I was pushing 60 when I started mm-hmm. Hey Girls. Mm-hmm. You know, why not? Why not in later life? Or why not when you're at uni? You, know, it's, um, you can do anything if you put your mind to it, I think. That's, that's fantastic, Celia. And I guess um, it kind of takes me to some of the things you were saying about but taking other people along with us and drawing on your own experiences. And I know you mentioned there and I've heard you talk before about um, your own experience of being on benefits and then understanding really what, what the issues are about if you're facing period problems. Authenticity comes in an even more compelling way when you tell the story of what your enterprise is doing. I guess and I'm really conscious that this, throughout this week and, and here and through what we've been doing on Good Finance, we're really celebrating the women who, who are out there and who are being successful and we, we, you know, we hold quite privileged positions now. And um, What more do you think that we can do to support the women who aren't yet visible and maybe who face other barriers to being successful or setting up an enterprise or accessing investment? I said I'll probably answer this through my own experience in terms of something that always felt made a massive difference to me was... Um, kind of events or panels or whatever but I think even in like meeting situations or just when you bump into somebody in the lift and have a you know your elevator pitch moment mainly I grew up in quite a working class kind of area and didn't really ever have kind of opportunities to work on how I spoke or whatever and always found my accent quite a something that held me back and I always kind of worried about what people might think of that so I was always very nervous to speak publicly I would encourage anyone out there to, who has a similar kind of barrier to me to just be brave and kind of push yourself to give it a try. So I, when I started Resonance, literally couldn't speak in public without my voice shaking and literally dreading it for weeks on end. I had to be brave enough to say to my manager that I was really struggling with that and could I have some help with it? And to his credit, he actually said, right, I've got a speaking opportunity coming up in a few months. Why don't you take that rather than me? So I think That was just a great example of how if you feel like you've got to that point where you do feel like you've got a platform and that you do feel maybe empowered to kind of share that spotlight and that platform with other people. But also on the other side, just to have that bravery to kind of say, actually, I know I've got something to say and I know it's going to be a bit scary, but um, I'm going to put that time into just practice that and give it a try really and that's definitely helped me feel more confident I guess to share my opinions and maybe push for doing things that I might have not pushed for before find your own voice which sounds very cliche but it's definitely worked for me and um, you've not always been as maybe as confident as you as you now appear to be today and I think it will only be encouraging for anybody for, for anyone else that's great coming from a completely different environment yeah. from the, the higher education <coughs> environment women don't put themselves forward mm-hmm. in the same way as men do and I had um, I was um, talking to a colleague um, explaining what I was doing here today and she said well men put themselves 
forward for promotion. Let's say there's 10 points that you, boxes you need to tick. When they've got five ticked, they put themselves forward. The women wait till they've got 10. And, and that's the difference. And it's the same as what Celia was saying, about having the perfect business plan. Exactly. And all, all, all yeah, the no, and that really struck a chord when, when you yeah. said that, Celia. And uh, it's, I think it, it probably goes across all sectors. Yeah. So basically, you've got to take a few risks, get out there and, and have confidence. It's very easy to say that because I know how difficult it is to do. But like Grace says, bite the bullet. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's the sisterhood, isn't it? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think I feel the sisterhood in this in this very yeah. room and in the networks yeah. beyond in terms well, of people who are encouraging. It, I think us. it's very important not to push the sisterhood thing because you should be helping male colleagues as well. It's about um, bringing every, everybody yeah, it, It's along. got to be inclusive. We've got to work together. Otherwise, it's just never going to work. Yeah, I think um, I think women in women in governance is a is a piece that we need to continually look at. So in, in the social enterprise space, when we're starting out, we tend to just, just take that friends, schools and families kind of approach to our board. But as, as your organisation starts to um, become viable and sustainable, then what opportunities are there to bring um, to bring women onto your boards and you know write a job description and go and hunt for a female t- to fill that role on your board. And I think you know women who are building big careers um, are very, very keen to put Governance down as something that they're, you know, they're either developing or they're working towards. So up in Scotland, we have, there's an organisation called Changing the Chemistry mm-hmm. that actively targets um, women executives or even sort of graduates um, from the corporate world to come into social enterprise and not-for-profit space and make their mark in in governance. So I think more of more of that is, um, you know, can only be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, be a good thing. Um, we have another another question from one of our attendees. Um, for each of you, really, can you can you t- let us know maybe one woman who's really influenced you or inspired you, and why? So I had the great pleasure of, yeah. of going to, going to a dinner where Michelle Obama oh, was wow. the speaker. Yeah, it's been, you know, far better than her husband, in my opinion. But <laughs> I just, you know, I, I just sort of sat there with my mouth the jaw listening to the, all the positive the real the authentic the strength that she was saying and all the messages and i did just think if every young woman could have just 10 minutes with michelle obama they would go out and completely rock the world so i think you know she she's a, a modern day superhero in, in yeah. my book yeah i think i think she's she's, she's every everyone's hero man yeah. or woman i think isn't she fantastic thank you celia i feel like i have to go for the cliche answer of I would say my mom, um, because um, so my mom was a single mom when we were growing up and left you uh, left school with no O levels at the time, no qualifications, and she went back to night school, qualified to be an, a nursery nurse, and then got really passionate about supporting adults with learning disabilities. So she kind of carried on her training in her evenings, became a community nurse at a time where adults with learning disabilities definitely didn't have um, very good opportunities at all. She's got very lots of very cool stories where she went out and kind of in the organisation she was working in, kind of changed a lot of things and told people how it was to kind of try and make the lives uh, their lives better. There's a crazy story, just as a quick example, where all the people on a ward that she was working on were being forced to share the same toothbrush so she went out and brought everybody a, a new toothbrush and kind of yeah refused to let the hospital carry on treating people in that way so that was just a small story but now she leads a whole disability initiative at a local hospital where she's the liaison nurse for the whole hospital making sure that people's rights are at the forefront of the treatment they're getting and making sure that not just adults uh, children as well with learning disabilities and autism can access all the health care that they need so she's definitely been my inspiration to kind of get involved in this sector and, yeah trying to some of the issues that I'll look at and think are definitely shouldn't be existing in today's society. Big shout out to my mom. <laughs> another another woman changing the changing yeah. the world, and it doesn't doesn't seem surprising in the least that you're doing what you're doing here in that. Well, my my inspiration is completely different. So I'm I'm a, a neurophysiologist. In science, I've met some absolutely amazing women, and quite often um, these are, are women from abroad because the UK used to be tremendously good at taking in. I mean, we've, we've benefited hugely from the influx of 
a foreign scientist, mm -hmm. but I've met women who've put their lives at risk. I mean, mm -hmm. just incredible stories, mm -hmm. pursued their science and, well, it's humbling. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, early on in my career, um, a Japanese lady, she was the first to get a PhD in Japan, wow. and she just said to me, you can do it. She said, but I have to tell you, you've got to be twice as good as the man sitting next to you. I think that was, she would at the time, yeah. it was a fair bit of advice. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked on that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask each of you if you had um, one piece of wisdom for women social enterprises or charities out there who are just starting out on their journey of trying to navigate their way around social investment what what would that be well of course i've never even thought about yes. being in a um, finance side but just for life in general get out there and do it have confidence it. in yourself but do your homework i mean it's been said already but i do think um women do have more of a tendency to kind of limit themselves and have loads of amazing ideas but feel like maybe it's not them that are going to do it and i've just been my final sort of encouragement really is to at least just let yourself entertain and um, how you could change the world on a bigger scale and just have a brainstorming session of all the stuff that, that you're passionate about and that you think should change and then just give it a go really I, I always think talking to people is the best place to start so whether it's anyone on this panel or have a look on the Good Finance website and see who else is out there. Do some Googling. That's literally how I got involved in social enterprise. I decided I wanted to get involved in the sector and literally just Googled. Sometimes you just have to put yourself out there and say, you know, you're a cool person. Can I have a chat? And I'm sure lots of doors will open if you give that a try. Yeah, I would say that there's a lot of um, a lot of investment out there, and it's about finding an investor with that, that you can build a relationship. With, it needs to be at a very open and transparent kind of discussion. You don't want to just grab the first deal and and, and hope it's going to be okay. So I think you know, absolutely do your googling, do your research, meet with different different funders, different organisations, and find out if you want. You know, investment is a long term thing. So do you want them in your life and in your enterprise life for quite some time? And make sure you don't just get bounced into the first the first mm -hmm. deal that's offered so, so, so take the power and make the choice yourself beautiful that's, that's really there. cool yeah um, so i've had a prompt to um, to share my own um influential woman and i guess the reason i probably touched the question is i'm not sure there is like one influential woman for me so in in my career i think i've and in in life in general and feel that i'm inspired by women each and every day in terms of the things that they do um, i find inspiration in in all of the all of the things that women are doing for each other, with each other in social enterprise um, each, each and every day. And that includes people in this room, um, in this office at Big Society Capital in terms of the women who are working towards social change. And I think also kind of take up the baton, feel, feel the need to take up the baton for what is still to come. So thank you very much to um, all our all our panellists, to Thelma, to Grace and Celia for um, being so open and um, sharing everything that you've you've achieved and that you've done and what motivates you if or on the practical side if uh, if anybody wants to know more about social investment please look at good finance for those tips and um, case studies resources to help you guide you through your journey um, but really what i'll be taking away i think is the inspiration from from all three of you to really think about and um, how we can be more visible to think about actually uh, the influence that we each hold and um, making making a difference and bringing more people along with us and working with men and women alongside each other and knowing that it's, it's a partnership along that way so absolutely thank you very much and thank you to good finance for, for, for hosting this today great thank you for listening